we were talking about uh, just how you started in comedy and Fat Joe show. Um, I mean, Pure Manati show truly was, I mean, I, I, you know, I've worked a lot with uh, Kagi um, you know, and worked on Bantu Hour and um, Queen yeah. Sono and Kathy Feelings and, yeah. um, you know, it was just so revolutionary. Not only the doors that opened up for you guys, but I think the doors that opened up for all comedians. Uh, what was that process like? Because Keggy loves to tell the story of like those six years how it was just a dream in both your head, you know, until it became yeah. a reality. It was crazy. For I actually wrote the entire script of the pilot episode of the Pure Manati show that we were using to to pitch the show. And uh, I stayed in Rez, Kahiso stayed in gigs, and then I started doing stand-up, and then I got a car, right? Yeah. So then I would pick up Kahiso, and we'd go to all these pitch meetings, or wherever we were trying to sell the show. From that time, before ETV started, uh, with Shalto Copley and them, who obviously went on to be in the... Uh, District 9 and, uh, and the A-Team as well. Jason Cope, uh, you know, who was also in District 9, because we, we all met around this time when we were trying to pitch. So there was a, a thing they called dead time TV, when TV stations go to sleep. And the idea was, now we're going to pitch and they're going to put the Pure Manati show from 11 o'clock at night when people are sleeping. And, and you know, that's why I said, six years since we came up with the idea in 97. Then someone at SABC, um, Kamsela, was working at the SABC. Between Kamsela and Homozo Matsunyani, someone found this pitch document in some box at the SABC. When we were on the Fetcho show, myself and Kahiso had been on the Fetcho show maybe for a season or, or two or something. And we got a call. And if you watch the first ever episode of the Pure Manati show, it tells the story of, hey, we were chilling doing this. And then the SABC guy arrives and John Barker played the SABC guy. And then he gave us this contract which was like terrible contract, but we signed it anyway. <laughs> and then we had to deliver a show in like so many weeks. And, you know, and, and we do a skit where I'm sitting at the park and uh, Kahiso calls me and tells me that we've got a TV show, right? But we shot the skit and uh, we had Clemma Wisa and someone else playing twins because I'm at the park and Kahiso calls me, tells me the thing. And then I turn to my left and I'm like, my babies, I've got a TV show. And then I turn to my right again, and then the camera zooms out. And then I go, my baby, I've got a TV show. <laughs> Amazing. So, so you can imagine, we had Claire Mawisa in the Pure Matthew show, first ever opening skit, episode one, season one, like 2003. And I mean, Claire was like the first black model on the cover of Cosmopolitan in South Africa. So just from the beginning, you know, obviously coming from having produced the skits on the Fed Joe show um, as our background, it was, we were having a ball, eh? We had the time of our lives. And then we got all these other guys from Riyadh to Chris Forrest, Ronnie Mudimola, Tsepo Mokhali, Lois Ogola was moving from uh, Cape Town to Joburg and... And then we had Joey Rasdeen was trying to sell us life insurance policies. That's how we met him. Uh, David Kibuka wanted to win uh, a stand-up comedy competition at the Comedy Underground that John Flesmas was running. That's why he got into comedy, to win 10 grand, which I had won before. And then him and Luis, I think, were the last two, and Kibuka won and got the 10 grand. When I won it, the original competition, when it started, the comedy underground competition, right? So for a whole year, every two weeks, I would be at the underground, new material, every Sunday without fail, for like a year. So you had to, every time you win a hit, the next round you need to have new material, the next round you need to have. But when I entered the competition, I was supposed to win a trip to London. 
and then the rent went to shit. <laughs> so the, the owner, the owner of, <laughs> so the owner of Comedy Underground couldn't afford the trip to London anymore. That's how we settled on the 10,000 rand win. Yeah, and then the following oh, year, the price was 10 grand, David Kibuka won, but that's how he got into pure Monati show and comedy, and because he just wanted the 10 grand, he didn't want to be a comedian. Now he's producing Trevor Noah's show, you know? So, crazy. The, the soundtrack to the pure Monati show, a friend of mine in UCT, Lesejo, used to make beats. It had been sitting in his laptop for like six years, and then I played this song for everyone. And Kahiso was like, "That's the song," you know. And everyone was like, "Yo!" <laughs> and it yeah. had been sitting in someone's laptop for like a few years as well. It's just so. Do you know what's so incredible about this whole story and what's so inspiring is the determination. Because actually you had everything like against you guys, if you know what I mean. Like you didn't have money, you didn't really know anybody in the industry, you didn't, you know. I, I almost said like, to you, I had money, but... <laughs> oh, you didn't have money? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I mean by that no, is like didn't. you guys had just no, come out of have... Nah, No, we didn't have you a know, like... a situation where it was like you're pitching from a big no. company or... No, no, no. Do you know no. what so, I mean? So... We didn't have money, but I was already doing stand-up. Kahiso was already doing stand-up. Yeah. Joey Rasdin was working at Alexandra Forbes. Tsepo Mokhali was working at Investec. I mean, Riyad Mosa was a doctor. <laughs> so, yeah, his forest, so have... uh, studied sports management, and he had been gigging for a long time by then, uh, having started with Joe Parker and them. Uh, so, we didn't have ridiculous money. But, you know, we were staying in townhouses. You know, I had a little polo player, my first car. Tsepo Mkhali had a Mercedes-Benz, actually, like an old C-Class. <laughs> yeah, he was doing well. And Kafiso just, <laughs> just never wanted to drive, never bought a car, but he was driven everywhere he went. So there was always someone who would drive Kafiso to airport, to gigs, to a pitch, wherever he wanted to go, there would be some, because there were no Ubers and he wasn't exactly, you know, taking taxis. In fact, he ended up sharing a flat with uh, Tsepo Mokhali, uh, who obviously became usually popular with the Spikos thing from, yes. from the Pure Monarchy show. Kim Engelbrecht was the only woman in the whole cast with like 10 men or 11 men. Crazy. And uh, so we got to hire a lot of extras if we needed girls. So our girlfriends, or women in the skits would be played by people who were supposed to be extras, but they ended up playing, you know, quite big roles purely because we didn't have full-time uh, cast or, or women in the cast. It was the nice thing for me about it. It was um, there was no such nonsense as you have now with comedians that are beefing with each other and they've, you know, put themselves in groups and, or they think they're in, 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 in groups and, uh, and posses. We had none of that nonsense, you know. I knew every single comedian in South Africa. I had worked with almost every single comedian in South Africa at the time. So, so yeah, man, and then obviously from the Pure Monati show, I mean, so many things came from that, you know. Kahiso produced LNN, we wrote, produced uh, Blitz Patroli, which is now one of the I love biggest Blitz, movies. Uh, Blitz Patroli is my favorite Kagi movie to date. Yeah, it's that doing, very, and, uh, it's doing extremely way. well on, on, on that platform. I don't know if I can mention the red platform, but Blitz is oh, doing okay. very, very well. Yeah, let's stay away from that. Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, if you haven't seen the Blitz Patrol, it's on Netflix. Go and watch. Uh, is it on Netflix? It's one of the biggest movies on Netflix. Blitz, I didn't realize Blitz Patrol is on Netflix. It is honestly my favorite. It's so funny. Someone it, says, I bought, and... I bought my data from Bo, my friend. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, both of our data, I think. Yeah. Um, 
And Blitz Patrol had you and David Kabuka. Me and Joey Rastin, David Kabuka, Chris Forrest, Kahiso, Tatsum Konzo, um, so Blitz, Luis Ocola, Tolles Mo. Oh, it was so great. I think Kagi has to do another like comedy. No, he will. I like mean, another, Kagi can't stop another now. Movie like that. Nah, Kakiso is not going to stop now. He, he will have a project at least every year, you know, or every two years, whether it's a TV series or a film, or if he's not producing, he'll direct. If he's not directing, maybe he'll produce. And But he's definitely in a position to always have something coming or happening. Or At any time, he's, he's developing or writing something. Yeah, totally. Um, and do you see yourself as, I mean, you've really done so much... Um, do you see yourself as a comic, first and foremost, or not necessarily? Always. I'll always see myself, even if I go into full-time business, my, my description will always be comedian and then filmmaker or entrepreneur or motivational speaker or pastor or whatever shit I end up getting into, selling masks and sanitizers. That will always come after comedian. Yeah, so, and uh, can we talk about blacks only? Because as a newbie comedian, you know, I haven't been in the industry for long. You get into the industry, and it's like a big goal for all of us. We all are eventually going to get onto big uh, blacks only. That's like a huge dream. You know what I mean? Um, what happened that you? Like, did you know you were going to start something that was going to be such a, like, a, an empire, basically? Um, and what was the motivation to start Black Only? Well, the motivation was, so, Black Only started in 2004. But because I'd been doing comedy for, like, five, six years, I actually was just performing to white people. And... Uh, we were doing king size comedy shows with Roddy Quinn, who's my partner, manager, for the past like 18, 19 years or something. And, uh, you know, I said to him, I want to do a show for black people. Or I want to do a show for yeah. Black Song because we would have had to direct the marketing and the audience, particularly to a black audience, right? So, October 2004. Nelson Mandela Theatre, um, which is now the Joburg, well, the Joburg Theatre in the Nelson Mandela Theatre, the main theatre. At 7 o'clock, there was a king size comedy show, a thousand white people with a different lineup. At 9 p.m., same theatre, a thousand black people for the first ever black only comedy show. YFM, <gasps> YFM through Greg Maloka was the media partner. You know, we targeted our advertising at your Sowetan and what other newspapers. Chris J. Gavanda, uh, Lois Okola, Kim Engelbrecht, uh, who was actually killing in stand up comedy. Uh, and I've got all this on tape, but I've got this show recorded. I think it's even on, on YouTube. I don't, I don't know. I'll have to check. Or oh, my set is on YouTube from 2004. And um, so that was 2004, right? And then 2005, I don't know why, but you know, Roddy booked the Santon City Convention Center where there were more than 4,000 people. And there were people sitting on the floor. The people arrived at like 6 p.m. for an 8 o'clock show. It was unbelievable. And the rest is history, you know, moved it to Empress Palace yeah. for like 10, 12 years, did three, four shows a year, like two and a half, three thousand people a show. The did Dome in 2018. Then, then we did the Dome in 2018, like 10,000 people at a show. And um, it's, it's been a ride, you know, I'm just too lazy. I've been offered to write a book. I've been lazy. I think I'll probably do an audio book before I write a book. Yeah. Or, or I'll just podcast it and then someone can write a book from that. 
yes, we need to we need to read we need to read your story. It's actually you know that's that's what I'm talking about. Like you don't realize, or maybe you do realize, um, just how like important and huge and big as a start off comedian like, your story is and how we look up to you and it's just I mean it's legendary. Yeah, I've lost my I voice mean the now. truth is. The truth is, is most likely none of us are going to be performing for, you know, who knows, the next three months, six months, a year. It's going to be a long time. Do you have any plans to do stuff online and have you done comedy online yet? I won't stand here and say to people I'm doing comedy, but I'll produce content that's suitable for Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. And then I'll take recorded stand-up comedy shows and send them out or produce them or put them out. But I won't sit here and say I'm going to do stand-up comedy. That's not stand-up comedy. You can call it whatever you want, but the tradition of stand-up comedy, you stand in front of a crowd and you make them laugh. And I like to keep my shit very simple. If you want people to talk and talk to a camera and be funny you can do that but it's not stand-up comedy this is so exciting i am obviously not only a huge fan i respect so much that i get to talk to you that you give me amazing advice um you know dave kabuka before when i I actually started comedy. Um, I was working with Dave Kabuka doing improv with him and stuff like that. Um, you know, and I would say that I kind of got into stand up because of him. And David was my, um, my, like he, everybody would say he's the Yoda of comedy. He would always give me advice. And he still does it. He still does that today. I'll WhatsApp him and I'll be like, please, I need you. And when I'm in New York, I see him. But I feel like I'm, you have been that for me now. So You know, so I really everyone, appreciate that advice so much. Everyone will play a different role in your life. And you must be at peace with it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong yeah. with having met someone and then you never see them again. Um or work with some people and they move on to do other things. And you must never think anybody owes you anything. Otherwise, you'll go crazy. Yeah. So you must always do what you're doing because you want to, not because you're expecting anything in return or you think some miracle is coming to you after all. So he's, David Kibuka played that role and continues to play whenever he can or when you see him in New York, etc., etc. You know, whether it's me or yeah. he saw someone else will play a certain role. Um, yeah, there's no 